Welcome back to Anything and Everything, everyone, the show which acknowledges that everyone has a story. I'm your host and producer, Halima Sharif. As you all know, I have had a diverse group of awesome guests on the show from actors, musicians, comedians, business people, etc. That's the whole idea of Anything and Everything. Each conversation has its own series or segment. There is the basic Anything and Everything, then there is the New Orleans Music Legends series and the Women of Color Catalyst series, and it just keeps growing. Well, now we have the artist circle. And today's first guest for the artist circle is the awesome Mr. Mark Whitfield Sr. Welcome, Mark. I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, congratulations to you and the show to all the success. I'm glad to be a part of it. Oh, man, I'm excited to even have you on here. And I appreciate those words, you know. Mark, the last time I saw you um, was in 2015 in Atlanta. You and your sons, Mark and Davis, were performing at the Velvet Room in Atlanta. Man, that was an awesome show. I still have those pictures. Yeah, that was uh, it was a great weekend. If I if memory serves, that was Father's Day weekend, and I and uh, a young man who I met when he was just getting out of college, bass player at Roland Garrett, and uh, he and his son joined us. So we had the, we did a fathers and sons show. So that's, right. that's right. That's right. That's right. Mark Davis and Roland and his, and his son Morgan playing saxophone. Yeah, man, and, that was uh, awesome. nice quintet weekend, a Saturday and Sunday there at the Velvet Room. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that Velvet, was, that's the name of the Velvet Note, sorry. The, the Velvet, I think it was called the Velvet Room, right? Oh, Velvet Room, okay, well, something like that. Velvet, right. Note. Velvet something, I go with that. It was awesome, okay? It was awesome, and you were there, it was nice to see you for sure. Well, listen, it's good to see you again, even though we're virtual, but it's a blessing to see you, man, it really is. Amen to that. You know, before we get started, I have a quick commercial break. Um, okay. I like to give a huge shout out to my graphic designer, Mario Robinson, who, who knows the Halima's brand big time. I have been working with this brother since 2010 mm -hmm. and he always gets it right. Even when I contact him at the last minute and he's the one responsible for all my branding, my logos, the Zoom backgrounds. Mario, thank you, brother. Of course, don't worry, I'm not trying to get on your good side because you know I got more stuff coming away, but I just had to give you a shout out, y'all. Look him up, Mario Robinson. So let me go into Mark's bio. Mark Woodfield graduated from Boston's prestigious Berkeley College of Music, the world's foremost institution for the study of jazz and modern American music in the spring of 1987. Shortly thereafter, he returned to his native New York to embark upon a career as a jazz guitarist that afforded him the opportunity to collaborate with legendary artists, including Dizzy Gillespie, Art Blakey, Quincy Jones, Ray Charles, Herbie Hancock, Carmen McRae, Gladys Knight, Jimmy Smith, Clark Terry, Shirley Horn, Wynton Marcellus, Branford Marcellus, Joe Williams, Stanley Turrentine, and his greatest teacher and mentor, George Benson. In 1990, the New York Times dubbed Whitfield as the best young guitarist in the business. Later that year, Warner Brothers released his debut album, The Marksman. The success of his debut release led to a recording career that has produced a total of 14 solo recordings and a myriad of collaborative efforts with some of the most important artists in recent years, Sting, Steven Tyler, D'Angelo, Mary J. Blige, John Mayer, Shaka Khan, Jill Scott, Diana Krall, Christian McBride, Chris Boddy, Roy Hargrove, and Nicholas Payton. Along the way, the Whitfield family band was born, literally. In 1994, the Mark Whitfield Quartet appeared on the Thanksgiving Day broadcast of Good Morning America. This performance featured a very special guest drummer, four-year-old Mark Whitfield Jr. It was obvious even then that he was destined for greatness. Following in his father's footsteps, he attended the Berklee College of Music and graduated in 2011 with honors. He went to study for his master's degree at the Manhattan School of Music while simultaneously embarking on a career as a drummer extraordinaire. He has quickly earned a reputation as one of the best young drummers in jazz 
and was nominated for a Grammy in 2014 as part of the ensemble featured on Kenny Garrett's 2013 release, Pushing the, Pushing the World Away, not to be outdone by his older brother, Davis Whitfield, a pianist, earned a presidential scholarship and graduated from the Berklee College of Music with honors in 2014. You got some amazing kids, man. Thank you. Together, the Whitfield family band has created a brand new recording project, Grace. It was released, what is it being released? Oh, it's already released, I'm speaking in past tense. It was released in January of 2017. It features Mark Whitfield on guitar, Mark Whitfield Jr. on drums, Davis Whitfield on piano, and Yashushi, you sh I'll always pronounce his name wrong, please forgive me, Yashushi Nakamura yes. on bass, and the incredible Cy Smith singing the title song, Grace. Welcome, Brother Mark. Hey, hey, all right. Thank you for that wonderful reading of my bio. It sounds, it sounds so elegant coming from you. <laughs> I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> That's your story. You know, I mean, it's it's amazing. Um, it's an honor to read it and, and to just know you personally. You know, I really appreciate all that you've done. You know, for your for your community, for your family. So you know, let's go into this interview because I want everyone else to know about your greatness. So, Mark, can you elaborate on the moment when you realized you wanted to be a musician? Sure, sure. Um, I had always wanted to be a doctor. And I come from a family of professionals. I'm the only musician. Uh, and I earned a scholarship uh, as, a high school, as a high school sophomore to the Georgetown University High School Juniors Internship Program for Science. And I attended Georgetown uh, the summer of 82 uh, uh, as, as a sophomore in high school between my 10th and 11th grade years uh, to study uh, math and science. And during that summer, my parents had you know, retired. So we, we were relocating from Long Island, which is where I grew up outside of New York, to a small suburb, suburb outside of Seattle, Washington, a place called Bellevue. Uh, my parents were retiring, wanted to move someplace new and slow down. Um, and I, so I took a guitar with me. I had always played music. I started playing. I played bass in the orchestra, alto saxophone in the band, and I played guitar. I took some private lessons, and I took a guitar with me to, uh, for the summer while I was at Georgetown studying. Um, and I found a lot of comfort, a lot of, uh, you know, I had a lot of, you know, as a, as a teenager, I had a lot of mixed emotions about leaving, leaving New York and going to someplace, you know, Seattle is a great city. And, and nowadays, lots of, there are lots of wonderful places to live. But in 1982, coming from New York, Seattle felt like a pumpkin patch, right? So I wasn't, I wasn't exactly excited to be going there. Uh, um, and we weren't, we, and we, the world wasn't connected the way it is now. There was no internet for us to use and cell phones and things like that. And so it was gonna be very isolating. Um, and when I got there, uh, uh, much to my surprise, I received a really warm welcome from the school, the band program that was there. And I immediately start, joined the jazz band, uh, but this time as a guitar player. My, my high school band from Long Island had attended the Berkeley College of Music uh, high school jazz competition. This, the, in, the, in the fall, in the spring, uh, prior to me going to Georgetown, and I earned a scholarship from a, a solo I took on the bass to attend Berkeley, which I had no, intent, no intention of using. But uh, I joined the jazz band in, in Bellevue playing the guitar. And a few, a few weeks later, we, we uh, um, attended a high school competition sponsored by Berkeley in Westminster, in uh, British, British Columbia. And I won another scholarship as a guitar player, and that moment, the moment they, 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 they incorrectly announced my name, they, they said, and from Bellevue High School, Mark Whitehead. <laughs> and while that was horrible, it was wonderful. At that moment, I, because I, I had a very short little solo and I had been playing guitar in the ensemble very long, but uh, I always felt like I, had a, I felt like I had a special connection to my inner voice with music. Uh, and, and I was, no, and trust me, I wasn't very good, uh, but uh, there's something about, it's something some people just have a connection to the music they play. And it's, it's not really based on how, on what you know or, how, or, or how, how, how developed it is. It's just a feeling that you can express yourself. And I think that's something that's universal that translates at a lot of different, at a lot of different stages in your development. And so that very moment when they call my name, as I was walking to the stage to accept my scholarship award, I knew right then that I wanted, I wanted to try and become a professional musician. I had no idea what that looked like or what that would be, but I knew that uh, um, 
I felt like I had I had what it takes. I had what it took to I would have what it took to become perfect to become successful, and I wanted to I wanted to feel more of that feeling, that experience of expressing myself, and feeling like uh, uh, that language, that universal language I was speaking, was something that everyone that was listening was somehow able to receive. Well, you did it. You you you, you created the path. It was destined to happen. I mean, and look at you now. You know. Um, that must have been very amazing, you know. Who during during the journey, and and I know we're going to talk about this more. But who were some of your influencers um, as you were coming up as a young musician? Yeah, you know, uh, um, at first it was teachers, you know, uh, people in school. You know, I had I had a, um, a band director, an, or, an orchestra director at elementary school, Henry Ray Williams, who was he had, he was had been a professional. Uh, basses, classical basses. And he got me started in the fifth grade playing the bass because he needed someone to play bass in the school orchestra. And, and I, I was a tiny little kid, but I had big hands. I was like a German Shepherd puppy, you know, boy, big, with big paws. And I remember feeling like I had to stay on a milk crate to reach the bass. But as long as I could get my hands in position, I could, you know, I could play fine. And he, he was so encouraging. Uh, I remember he even asked, you know, he got me into, into playing these classical solos in school and got, and, and I took to it right, you know, right away. I won some um, New York State Solo Awards as, as a classical bassist. And he even tried to get my parents to leave me with uh, living at his house when they moved to Seattle so that I could continue. He, he was, you know, he really wanted me. He was so encouraging. Uh, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, you know I, I certainly the first, uh, first of his uh, African-American students. And he, he grew up, I grew up in a place in a school in a white town on Long Island, you know, and, and, and uh, very few African Americans there in the school, and I was certainly you know, one of the few kids who played the orchestra. And I think he was just so taken by our relationship and our ability to connect. And he, he saw a bright future for me in a discipline and in a genre where African Americans had been shut out, you know, in terms of you know in classical music and playing orchestras and all that. And I think he really wanted to see me sort of blaze a trail in that way, and he, he believed that I would have a lot of success. I just wasn't that interested. I loved the instrument. I loved I loved the music. Um, but it, it, you, you just can't ignite a fire that doesn't exist. Like you just can't light a match to it. You know, if there's, if there's just, it was just no, uh, it was my interest in, you know, and I was completely convinced I wanted to, I wanted to go into medicine. One of my older brothers had attended Georgetown and went for Georgetown undergrad and law school there. And, and, and uh, it wasn't until that, I, you know, I got that guitar in my hands and, you know, and, and felt an emotional you know, inner voice connection to the instrument, to the music, and then to the people that I knew I wanted to do it. And then, and then all the things that he had sort of shared with me um, uh, were it inspired me in a different way. And then, uh, I, you know, I met some guys, uh, great musicians in Seattle. I was only there for a year because I, I skipped a year of high school from there and, and took my scholarship to Berkeley and went straight to Boston. And so I arrived in Boston in the spring of 1983. I was still 16, and that's when I enrolled at Berkeley. A few months later, I met Kevin, maybe six weeks later, I met Kevin Eubanks, the guitar player who uh, most recently was no, you know, the host of The Tonight Show with Jay Leno and all that. But his first record, he had, he had gone to Berkeley, and his first, his first recording, uh, Guitarist, had been released a few months before, uh, maybe over the summer of 82, something like that. Anyway, I, I had just become aware of him. And, uh, uh, and he came to Berkeley to give a master class and I met him and uh, he took me under his wing. He immediately, would, you know, he would come to town, come to Boston. He lived in New York, so he would come to Boston every, you know, once or twice a month to do concerts and all that. He, he would you know, come by and, and give me a lesson in my dorm room and, you know, I'd go out and hear him play and all these things. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a real sort of uh, uh, a sense of belonging from an apprentice standpoint, apprenticeship standpoint, to a community, and you know, I, I had roommates who were who were more uh, more advanced and more developed as musicians. Javon Jackson, the great saxophone player mm -hmm. and director of jazz studies at, at Hart in Connecticut, was my roommate. And Patrick Smith, the engineer from the Tonight Show, uh, he was there studying trombone. And and so, uh, uh, Joe Marcellus lived down the hall, and you know, we spent lots of nights arguing about music and and and, and just you know, build, build you know, William Calhoun, the for Living Color, lived around the corner in the dorms and, and there were so many great musicians, you know, in and around uh, uh, my immediate area. 
we, we, you know, we just, we would, we would kind of come together every day. We played and inspired one another. And, and uh, we sort of had the idea that if we could take this feeling and sense of community out into the world, we'd all have a, a launching platform for our music and our careers. Um, so a lot of the guys that I met there, a guy named Billy Kilson, a great drummer, James Gates, saxophone player. They were Ron Savage, who eventually became the um, administrator in charge of the birthday ensemble department. These, these, these guys were all, I mean, even had we been, had we started together, they would have been older than me, but they were almost graduated, uh, graduates. And so they were four or five, six years older than me. And they, they, they liked my energy and my spirit and, and, and my sort of naivete about the world. And they also you know, took me under their wing and, 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 I, and, and uh, I was a quick study. Uh, and I worked hard um, and I was earnest and, and sincere in what I wanted to do. Um, you know, tunnel vision is often criticized. When people, you know, they, they say, yeah, you know, you, you have to be, you have to be well-rounded. You have to be open to all things, and 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 nothing could be nothing could be more true than that. that, that that's a very that's a great place to be and exist where you're open to learning new ideas. But but uh, you know, as a young person uh, trying to chart a path to your own to your own development, I think one of the most important things is to ha is to set the sights on an attainable, reasonable goal and, and focus on achieving that. And so rather than worrying about uh, um, learning all these disciplines at one time, you just master one thing at a time, work, work through one and, and, let, and let a sort of a natural progression from one discipline to the next take place. And so this was my, this was my uh, unknowingly, this was my mantra for life. I, had, I didn't realize this was my concept, but this is, the, this is what I was following. So I got to New York. And I, uh, you know, I spent four years at Berkeley, and I, I, like I said, I you know, met a lot of these great people. Just like one time, I, I woke up to the sound of, of uh, uh, Branford Marcellus giving Javon Jackson a saxophone lesson in my dorm room, right next to my bed. You know, and he was teasing Javon about about blowing too much air to his horn. And there was one uh, one spring break, uh, um, Javon, because I, you know, I, 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 he, Javon was going to visit some friends for spring. I was going to stay at, at the school, and he said, "By the way, this, this young man's going to stay in, the, in, use my bed and stay in the room for a couple of nights." It was Kenny Garrett, and Kenny, you know, was playing mm -hmm. with our Blake at the time. Didn't, it didn't need a place to stay for a couple of nights in Boston, and so, uh, so these, you know, of course, none of these, none of these guys were famous yet, but they were well on there, you know, and so I. I uh, the benefit to me was that they, they were becoming familiar with who I was. We had a connection. So later on, that would come back, that would come back to help me. You know? and one of the things I did, uh, um, my friend Billy Kilson, great drummer, had, he started playing with the wonderful pianist Walter Davis, mm -hmm. who was famous for having started playing with, with uh, Charlie Parker when he was only 15. Walter was playing at this, at this club in New York. Billy worked for the phone company. He was married and had a, and had a young daughter. Uh, 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 and so he had a day job. And I was still in, at, going to school at Berkeley. So he would come by, uh, uh, he, he had a gig in New York that started with Walter at nine. He'd drive, he'd drive by my apartment, he'd get there by 5.30, we got off, and I, he would go to sleep and I would drive him to New York. So I'd drive, he'd sleep, and I, you know, and, I, and so we'd come to New York, he could do his gig, and I'd sit in and play a tune, and I remember I got to meet the great Pele, the soccer legend was there one night, I got to meet him, and then we, we would leave and go to the late night jam session at the Blue Note, and then I, uh, I drive back to you know drive back to Boston, and I would drive him. He could sleep, and I drive him right off at work. He'd go straight to work the next morning. And I'd keep the car, you know. And one of the guy and one of the guys that I met while we were at the at the Blue Note Jam session in New York became the leader of the Blue Note Jam session. So three years later, of course, when I graduated school, I came back. He gave me a job. So now it's, it's October or so of '87. And I'm playing there uh, with the, and he hired me to play with the late night band. And then Blue Note was having an anniversary celebration for the for their location where they are now, six or seven years at the time. And the host for the week was Billy Eckstein. So Billy Eckstein was there with his trio, and his special guests were Sarah Vaughn and Tony Bennett. And they were going to be singing and playing music all you know all night for six nights. And the job of the late night band, who normally played the early at four a.m was to come on during the break. So if they started at 7, they played from 7 to 8, we played from 8 to 8.30, just so they had continuous live music. Lo and behold, the first night he walks in as a special guest is George Benson. Then George Benson comes in, and I'm, and I, you know, and I'm, and I'm speechless, right? I'm just sitting there, and, 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 uh, uh, and of course, he wants to sit in and play uh, with, 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 uh, with Billy Eckstein and Tony Bennett and Sarah Vaughan, and he didn't have a guitar. The club owner said, hey, Young man, come here. Uh, I didn't, didn't even know my name at the time. Hey, young fellow, come here, George Benson. I know, I know, I know. 
he wants, uh, you mind if he uses your guitar? Of course not, you know, and, and so they introduced me to George and I met George and his wife. And we talked for a moment and uh, he went out and played and it was marvelous, of course, and he came back. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, well, you know, what, this is great. Uh, I'll be, I'd be way too nervous to play for him, so fortunately I won't have to. And then just as I was thinking that, uh, uh, Billy Eckstein said, well, after that performance, we're going to take a break and we'll have the young men come up here and play a little bit. <laughs> so now I had to go up and play. And George could see I turned white as a sheet, right? So he, he just said, hey, you know, uh, um, I wish I could hear you play this time, but I can't. My wife and I have another commitment. So we got to take off, uh, and what he and what they did. If he, he went, that you could stay, he went and stood by the door at the Pluto where I couldn't see him, and so I was inspired by the fact that I had just went, met my ultimate hero, and and he played so wonderful, and then relaxed because he wasn't there to make me nervous, and I probably played the best thirty minutes of my entire life, and he was there to hear to hear every note. So he left me a, a message that he would be back the next night or be back soon to see me to see me again. And, uh, uh, and, and that started me on the journey, of, you know, the next, the, next, the next part of my journey. Uh, um, and I really can't speak enough uh, to, enough to you know, the point of, of how generous and interestingly generous uh, uh, of a man George is because at this time, this was 1987, he was in the middle of a run of platinum records. We're not talking about jazz guitar stroke. We're talking about superstar, you know, R&B, Peebo Bryson, George Benson, you know, James Ingram. That's who he was at that time. And he, uh, and so uh, he, you know, he, like he said, like, you know, a week later, he was there on a Tuesday, Wednesday night at one in the morning, you know, they, sitting, at, sitting at a table, drinking champagne, watching me play, and invited me out to his place, picked me up in a Rolls Royce. You know, took me out to his mansion in, 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 you know, in the hills in Englewood, New Jersey, spent time with me. Uh, um, and it was really just because he saw something in me that he liked, you know, so, something, uh, a spirit uh, um, that I see in many young people today, you know, the desire to do, to just do one thing and do it really well. I wasn't concerned about having a career. I wasn't asking him for, for jobs or, or recommendations. All I wanted to do was play the instrument and play better. And, 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 and uh, that naivete and that purity of intent was what, uh, um, in, in a way, it was like he couldn't do enough for me because he, because he realized that, you know, I wasn't trying to get anything from him other than the knowledge and the wisdom that he really wanted to hand off, that he really wanted to pass down, you know. And so uh, I know you asked me about people that, that have died. I really only mentioned two people in, in the last eight minutes, but it's just Kevin Eubanks and George Benson up to that point were the two people I think that had uh, uh, the, the most profound, Im profound impact on 20-year-old Mark Whitfield. Man, that is amazing. You know, as, as, as you were talking, I was, I was jotting down some, some stuff here. Um, <clears throat> your path was laid out for you, whether you realize it or not. I mean, it was just happening. But even though you mentioned earlier that you wanted to go into medicine, well, actually, this is your medicine. Sure. It was very medicinal, um, and and it sort of it sort of created its own path. And along the way, you met all these wonderful people. I mean, who would have thought that you meet all these wonderful people who were a part of that journey to to create you to help you to be the person you are today and beyond. You know, so that's a lot of people just can't say that. You know, um, it was laid out for you. Yeah. Those are legends, you know, and you know. And speaking of George Benson, you you mentioned George Benson. You mentioned Kevin Eubanks. And you're bringing back all these memories. Um, Love them both. What was that like for you, having him as a mentor and then being able to work with him? You know, how has that impacted your life as a musician, as well as his impact on music? Well, you know, we talk, especially uh, uh, with regard to to young men of color. We talk about self confidence. You know, there are not a lot. Of, there are not a lot of things in our everyday life that reinforce the idea that we can succeed, that we can be, we can be, uh, we can end up as more than we started. I fortunately came from a family of very strong, successful African American men. My father was will always be my one and only greatest hero, and my older brothers occupy the same space for me in my mind. You know, I, I was late. I came late in life for my parents. My I'm 20 years behind my brothers. Uh, and so I had the, you know, I, I always had really good examples, really strong examples of what, it, of, you know, people who look like me doing well, and that's important. You can see, 
you can you can have an idea that you you know this idea that you can grow up and do what you want. But when you see someone who looks like you, who who speaks like you, who you know who who has your mannerisms and your and your ideals and your hopes and dreams, that that helps it you know. And and so being able to be around someone like George um, was profoundly important for my uh, my sense of self. Um, and it was it, because it wasn't about um, it wasn't that I imagined myself one day being like him. Uh, uh, my, it, it, it was that some, you know, getting to know him and he, he was very, I, George was really, really uh, honest and open with me about his story, about right? being a young man and the struggles coming from Pittsburgh and, and the things that he had to do uh, uh, to, you know, to, to you know, I, just near misses that, uh, if, you know, if, if, you know, one inch to the left and we wouldn't even know the man that we know, you know, and so all these, you know, stories like that, uh, um, you realize that, that uh, uh, you know, at, at our core, we're all sort of the same. Some people have gifts and opportunities and, and, and have prepared themselves to take advantage of things. And when you know what someone else's story is uh, and you see how miraculous the journey can be, all of a sudden it becomes less daunting to believe that your own journey can be as miraculous. And, and as, you know, as, as, and so the, 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 most, the most important thing for me was I, I it, I, I, I began to feel like anything was possible as, as, as long as I remained uh, steadfast and, and was prepared and worked hard and was true to myself. And, and I could see as I, you know, I got a little older and, and was continu continuing to meet people and be exposed and, and travel, started traveling around the world you know, through George, George's uh, recommendation. I joined Brother Jack McDuff's band. And so uh, um, a few months later, I was touring the world with Jack McDuff, which was an entirely different experience. Uh, um, uh, and there were so many things, uh, um, so many pitfalls and so many uh, trap doors and so many issues that, you know, that come along with all the accolades and, and, and opportunities for success that young musicians are, are you know, are, 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 are have available. And so um, being around George and being around my father and my brothers and having a real strong sense of self allowed, you know, gave me uh, uh, the vision and the strength and, you know, and, 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 and the, the, the tunnel vision, which I, which I referenced earlier, to just stay on my path and not be concerned with what these cats were doing over here or what they did after the gig over here. I did what I did and I was fine with that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, <clears throat> that kept me clear headed and and on and on a and on a and on a fast path to success. I didn't realize that at the time, oh, but but I, that's just who I was, and so uh, uh, that was the most important thing. Being around George, uh, uh, and he was and he was really good about that. He always wanted me to see uh, what the possibilities were. He, I, you know, uh, uh, and and you know, George had, had you can imagine he hadn't spent a lot of time. Uh, um, you know, it, it, with his formative education, most of his education was as a, was as a grow up. You know, he, he hustled and did his thing, and and he's very ed educated, articulate. You know, an intelligent man. But a lot of that he had to go find on his own as he got older. And I remember one time, one of my visits to his house, he had just come back from bringing his bringing his family to the Hayden Planetarium, and he wanted and he, and he pushed the button and a button and a movie screen came down in one of the big windows and he started showing me the planets, you know, and he was, <laughs> and it was so fun. I just played along. He had no idea. He was like, see, brother, the woman with the rings about it, that's Saturn, you know, and it, it was just, you know, and it, but it, the, the idea was just that, was that he was just so willing and so uh, insistent on, on sharing information and exposure. Uh, um, uh, and he could see that, you know, that, that, you know, that, 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 that look in my eyes, it just, you know, just soaking it all in. And, 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 uh, um, he, and so that was just one, and it, it, I can't, I can't speak about it enough. How, how wonderfully reinforcing that was for me. You were hungry and it paid. Yes, the, That's right. Yeah, sure. you, you, I mean, being hungry is much deeper than just playing the music. It was actually understanding the business. Um, Amen. And, and you were surrounded by it, like I said earlier. So, you know, you are a part of one of the last generations to experience being on the road with some of the great masters of music, such as Milt Jackson, Jimmy Smith, Ray Brown. What are some of your most memorable moments from that period? Um, what I remember the most about Ray Brown, uh, which is, you know, it's funny because uh, he's someone whose career 
um, is not talked about much. Uh, uh, it's almost like he's kind of taken for granted. But it's, you know, I mean, not only is he uh, on a short list of the greatest bass players of all time, uh, he was also a great, a great businessman. He was a manager. He managed his wife, Ella Fitzgerald, for a long time. He organized a lot of recordings, uh, hundreds of recordings and performances for all kinds of for all kinds of musicians. And he and he, uh, including managing himself, uh, uh, and and make and paving the way for lots of great young musicians uh, um, and and musicians his, and his contemporaries to have careers. And uh, but he was one of the most matter of fact. A, a straight line between point A and point B people I have ever met in my entire life. Uh, it was just so simple. I remember a story once he told me about uh, uh, being part of the jazz at the Philharmonic uh, uh, concerts as part of Oscar Peterson's trio. And he says, you know, they were, it was so, you know, Norman Grant had these great, you know, these wonderful concerts organized. And so there's Ray Brown with Oscar and, and uh, I think Buddy Rich playing drums, maybe, um, Maybe Barney Kessel playing guitar. And then you'd have, he said they'd have all these, you know, the, the great saxophonists, you know, and come out. And Lester Young would come out, and, and he said then they had the ballad level, and you know, Lester Young, and Cole Robbins would come out, or Ben Webster, you know, all these guys would come out. And so Ben Webster came, and you walk up, you whisper in the, into Oscar's ear what song you wanted to play and what key, and you go play your song, you know. And, and so, Ben uh, was so after all these guys came out and played, Ben Webster was come out, steal the show, and he came out. And he and he, he whispered and, and uh, Oscar was yeah I want to play uh, I want to play Danny Boy in B, and and of course they messed it all up you know Danny Boy is not in B and they couldn't get it together oh. and they and they embarrassed Ben Webster and they could see the other guys in the wings kind of chuckling like we all would be doing as they messed up his song behind him you know and so he said afterwards he was feeling kind of bad but whatever figured no big deal he's in the back packing up his face. And I don't know where, pop, he said somebody smacked him across the back of the head. And he out and it was Ben Webster. And he's like, man, what did you do that for? He says, man, why'd you mess up my goddamn song? And he, says, well, you, he said, well, you called it in B. He said, well, you ain't got no B on that bass? You know, and so, and so uh, Ray said, so it means I unpacked my bass immediately. And I went and grabbed Oscar O.P. And he said, we immediately worked on a, on a, on a, on a system for, for transposition. We no longer worried about the key. We just needed to hear the first note of the song, find our find our starting point, and then we followed. We let our ear follow us through the you know through the through the through the roadmap that is the harmonic journey of the song, and we never made another mistake like that again. And so he told me that story because he heard me play a, I was playing a thing with his band, and he said, oh, "I play something solo," and I played the very thought of his ballad I love to play. And he said, "Well, the next," he said, "Tomorrow night, man, I want to jump on that with you." And I said, "Great." So when, when, when I got ready to play it, I said, "It's an A flat." He said, "Don't tell me what key it's in. Just start playing. I'll be fine." And and I, and I thought, and I must have looked at him like, "Oh, that's odd." And so when we got finished, he told me that story, and, I, and, and he showed me kind of how they went about it. Uh, um, and he, you know, and it was just his point was, it, 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 it needs to get done. You do it, and you move on. That's right. Right. You know, it's just, you, you, we don't. You, there's no drama. There's no discussion. There's no arguing. What well, you got this? You need to get that. We do that. We move on. We we were playing, we were touring, and he had. You know, he obviously had all these wonderfully uh, classic old instruments. You know, uh, some of the you know the greatest basses in history usually come from, Czech, from the former Czechoslovakia. He had all these Czech basses that were 100 years old. All these things, and and uh, we got to France, and uh, they must have uh, taken his bass. Off of the plane and moved it to the moved it to the freight section. Maybe they used to do that when traveling internationally. Everything didn't go to the, didn't have oversized luggage back then. Mm -hmm. You had your, your luggage, and then if it was too big, it went to the freight section. And so they must have un, unpacked it with a forklift, and they turned his base into a pancake of splinters, right? <laughs> right. In the, that, and so I'm laughing now because I just it just seems so surreal. You know, sitting with I'm standing next to Ray Brown, and they come out with a flat with this flattened fiberglass, you know, mess with his bass up with it. He didn't even blink. He looked, he just said, all right. And we left, uh, he was gonna have his manager take care of it, his assistant, whatever. They brought him a student model bass to the new, to the jazz club, the new morning in front of a solo audience. And he played some of, he played some of the most beautiful music I'd ever heard mm -hmm. uh, without batting an eye. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and I remember thinking that's, wow, I could never do that. Until a few years later, I remember being out with my group and a guy picked up my guitar and dropped it and snapped it. 
in the middle of a tour. And for the rest of the tour, I had to play these rented guitars every night in Europe. And I, you know, having seen Ray Brown do it and not even think about it. I didn't, I didn't get emotional about it. I didn't, you know, I didn't worry about whether or not people were going to be impressed by this horrible guitar I had to rent tonight. They bought a ticket to see Mark Winfield. That's who they were going to see. And that's, that's what they were going to hear. And so it was that sort of matter of fact uh, attitude about, make, about making things happen. With Jimmy Smith, it was, uh, Jimmy Smith was all about position. He was someone that was very, very strict about, about what, he, what he delivered and how it was received. And, and uh, it didn't matter what your intentions were. He was very sensitive to your actions. And I remember once we, we were playing at the, uh, we played the Essence Fest at the Superdome in New Orleans, one of the first ones. And uh, uh, I remember this because while we were there, R. Kelly was trying to drive his Jeep up on stage and they wouldn't let him in. <laughs> I remember that because I was there. That was, that was one of the first Essence music. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking, what is this fool? He had, he had a song, he reminded me of my Jeep and this idiot decided he needed to drive his Jeep on the stage. Yeah. And he got as far as like into that outer, outer ring, you know, and they wouldn't, and they were like, man, your stage is not gonna hold your Jeep. And he got, and he just backed up and drove and didn't do the show, right? As I recall. So we were playing, remember they used to have the rooms upstairs, they had four rooms, jazz and, oh, and everyone. The lounges, exactly. And so we're playing up there. And it's, and it's a really funny story because at this point, uh, this is maybe the year after Little Mark had played with us on Good Morning America. And so I was making a regular habit now, if we were close to home, we were still living in Baton Rouge at the time making a regular habit of having him come out and play a song with the band, you know, and he would have his little sticks and he would sit in the chair on the side while we were playing, you know, and so, so uh, the deal was my band was going to play uh, a set uh, and then we'd open for Jimmy Smith and I was going to play Jimmy's set with him as his guitarist, right? So we played and little Mark sat on the side with the sticks, you know, and sat wait, wait, wait patiently, you know, and when his time came up, he got up and he played his song, took his solo, took his big bow, the crowd went nuts. You know, Jimmy was on the side watching the whole thing. He loved it, right? And so, uh, uh, and you know, and I was always talking so uh, romantically about, you know, uh, romanticizing all the legends. You know, Mark was a little kid, but he, he had, but he had, he already had a lot of love for all these guys, but he stood here and be talking about them, you know? And so I, uh, um, uh, after the show, he's like, Danny, 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 I want to meet Mr. I want to meet Mr. Jimmy Smith. I want to meet Mr. Jimmy Smith. So, so, <laughs> so we went and went to Jimmy's dressing room, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, Jimmy said, "Hey, boy, you sounded good. And that's your little boy that played drums, huh?" And you know, and his voice was was gruff and rough, you know, and 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 you know, little Mark was expected to be, you know, soft spoken like it, like like his grandpa, you know. And, and he said, "Hey, boy." Uh, What's your name? He said, I'm a Mark Jr. And he, yeah, he said, uh, do you just play drums with your dad or you go play with me? And uh, uh, he said, uh, he got scared. Little Mark got scared. I could feel, I could feel him. He's getting a little tired. He's like, uh, uh, no, I don't think I want, I, I, I'm okay. Like, I don't want to play with you. And he said, well, fuck you then. Well, fuck you out of here. Get you doing it in my dressing room. <laughs> he said, fuck you. Walk out of here. Get that boy out of here. And I was like, did this old man just cuss at my son? <laughs> Right, so my first instinct was to go up, you know, but I was like, well, okay, you know, I, I asked for it, I brought him in here, right? So, you know, never mind. So we walked out in the hallway and we got out there and I, and I was thinking I was gonna take a solo. And little Mark said, Daddy, Daddy, he said, uh, I'm okay, I wanna go, I wanna play with him, I wanna go back in. And I was like, okay, let me see what you got, little fella. So we went back in and Jimmy says, Jimmy said, well, now what you want? He said, I wanna play with you. And he said, oh, okay, okay, boy, you play with me then. So, so now it's going to be great, right? So we go out, and he's sitting on his little stool, you know, you know the side of the stage, waiting for his turn. And the first song we played was Midnight Special, you know, one of, one of, the, one of the fan favorites, right? We played it, and, it went, and people went crazy. And after, But Jimmy didn't like people yelling things at the stage. He didn't like, you know, uh, uh, he, 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 was, he, wanted, he felt like there was a, there was a, a, a a, a protocol, uh, you, you know, if you go to attend the concert, you ain't gonna go to Carnegie Hall and start yelling at the symphony what they tell them what, what they should be doing, so don't do it to me. You know, clap when you clap, scream when you scream, and then be quiet. And, and I understood that. Just from point of view, it was a certain kind of, you know, a modicum of respect mm -hmm. and a protocol for behavior, right? So we, we played, so after all, after all the applause died down, this woman in the back yelled, Jimmy, I love you. And he's like, I love me too, bitch. And I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh. 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 U
Mike's special. He said, oh, shit, now you're going to make me mad. And he started cussing, you know, God damn it, we didn't just play the that special. And I looked over a little bar, and he had tears coming down his eyes. He was like, oh, daddy, help. And his grandmother came to stage, and he jumped off the stage. And me and Jimmy died laughing. He's like, oh, like I can't, I'm not good with all that. And that, that was the beginning and the ending of his performance with Jimmy Smith. Oh, man. Oh, but, uh, but, you know, it, Go ahead. How old was Lil Mark at the time? Oh, five. That's the yeah. longest, man. <laughs> he still remembers that, too, which is so yeah. funny. But there was no way in hell he could put up with all that. Uh, uh, and, you know, and they spent, and they ended up, obviously, my kids spent a lot of time around Jimmy as they got older. They, were, yeah. they loved him very much, and he was very <laughs> fond of them. But what I realized with Jimmy was, his thing was, people will treat you no matter who you are in the, the way that you present yourself and the way that you allow them to treat you. And since, I, and since I'm only okay with being a treat, treated a certain way, I take control of that. Exactly. So I'm here to play my organ, you're there to listen. Mm, that's right. So I'm gonna play and you're gonna listen. Now if that's not okay, you don't have to be here. You know, and so, uh, but I'm not leaving because you're not because you're not in control of that. And I and I and he took that with him everywhere. Um, there were a few times, you know, uh, and I had, I did have, excuse me, I did have the, the honor and the pleasure of, of of spending time with with guys like Jimmy as they got older. Yes. And 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 uh, I felt like it was I, I I was really privileged to be able to sort of help them at that time. One of the things I remember, Nicholas Payton and I, we were, we were touring with Jimmy together. We were playing in Sweden, mm -hmm. and uh, for whatever reason, he just didn't feel like playing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the man was, you know, older and it wasn't feeling well. And we got out, and 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 so he was at that point. He was sensitive if things weren't were, were just right. That the stage was fine, but I did I did hear him with this. The ba instead of having a band shell or a backdrop, mm -hmm. they had constructed this thirty foot high plexiglass wall. Mm -hmm. Right, which is oh, well, exactly, it's already curious. And then they realized it was a death trap for birds. So they put, so they had to, so they had to paint all these birds so that the other birds wouldn't fly, but it didn't work. Yeah. Right? Because so while we're playing, they were just birds, just like, just bam, you know, kind of fall, you know, I, I just because they, you know, they could see the people there and you know, popcorn if it was outdoor, outdoor venue. And so the birds would come around and be just killing themselves hitting this thing. And I'm just like, where the hell, well, who thought of this? You know, and why can't they just take it down? Like, is it a landmark, you know? So uh, uh, we didn't get through the whole show. Mm -hmm. I say we, we were supposed to play 75 minutes, we probably played 30 or 40 minutes. And the good 10 of that was guitar solo, the other 10 was drop the drum solo. Like Jimmy didn't do much playing, he was, and he was done with it. And he went back to his dressing room and wouldn't come out. And so what the interesting thing was, the crowd, uh, um, the audience, they felt, I think they all sort of understood, they were like, all oh, kind of like, yeah, like this, is, we're kind of like, sorry, we apologize for putting you in this heart. You know, they, I think they felt bad but they all still wanted to have some sort of interaction with him. So it was an outdoor venue, kind of imagine like Jones Beach, something like that, you know, and, and, and they lined up, there had to be 200 people in line with records for him to autograph. And, 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 uh, uh, and I went and I said, Jimmy, you know, people would, and I'm thinking, well, he didn't really play, so I'm, maybe he'll take pictures and all that. He's like, I'm not signing shit, get out of, get out of here. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I said, Nick, let's do this. So me and Nick went out and I said, listen, I, mean, I said, well, listen, Jimmy's not feeling well. So what we're gonna do is I'll we'll take me and Nick will take five, you know, we'll take five records at a time each. And we'll go in and we'll let him sign them, we'll bring them out. And and uh, he's just gonna sign his name, won't be any, you know, won't be any person, but he'll sign them for, for all of them. And we'll do as many as he's willing to. And so we me and Nick, we signed all, we signed all 200 of those records, the two of us, we signed his name. You know, and, and, and a few people a few people wanted pictures and I got Jimmy to come to the door. You know, uh, uh, but I felt really honored and privileged to be able to kind of help him, you know, when he needed a hand. And, and there were lots of situations where I was there for him because he was so generous and, and, and so loving. Uh, um, and, you know, a lot of guys, uh, like Milt Jackson, a real sweetheart, 
one, but one of the most uh, uh, natural and matter of fact musicians. Uh, once again, it was a certain sort of prevailing theme, uh, theme uh, between all those, all the guys of that generation. Uh, uh, we play music. Uh, we, you know, we create the music. We play the music. We deliver the music. You know, and then we, and then we keep it moving. You know, we, we don't. We, uh, um, and they, they carry themselves with dignity and respect. They treat, they treat each other that way, and they demanded that from the people around them and they had and they had careers uh that were re reflected uh re you know of, of of the way that the way that they carried themselves and that sort of dignified presence and i was always uh, so proud to consider myself a part of that legacy to see these to see these gentlemen who had uh, um who had brought themselves up in the music business at a time uh, uh you know, I mean, I spent some time working with Ray Charles, and I, you know, and, and for all of the, the you know, the, the conflicting myths and stories and the horrible things that have been said about the man and all that, you know, I un I got to be around him and understood uh, uh, what, just to imagine the struggles of you know, you're a musician, you know, white musicians weren't treated so well with so much respect in this country in the early part of the century. So imagine being an African American. You know, Jack McDuff talks about having his, having his quartet with George, with young, you know, 20 year old George Benson, Joe Dukes on drums, and Red Holloway, the saxophone player. But when they would get below the Mason Dixon line, they had, you know, red could pass for white, and they had to send Red Holloway in to get food or pump gas, or they, or, you know, or they, they would risk being arrested. This, and they're going to, to play a concert for these people who've hired them. And the sheriff in that time would arrest them for being there. You know, uh, 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 you know, stories with guys saying, you know, that Jimmy Smith said one time they were, they were driving through Alabama with his band and uh, State Trooper pulled them over for just for, you know, driving while black in 19, <laughs> 1958, you know, and, and made him get out and, and uh, he locked, put him in jail and uh, uh, locked him up and, and, and uh, they were going to spend the weekend in jail. I may have the story somewhat wrong, but they were, they were, they were spending time in jail. But then, but then the sheriff said, well, I got good news for you boys. The judge is a jazz fan and he's willing to let you out if you come to his house and play in his barbecue. <laughs> a barbecue of all things, right? <laughs> you know, you know, they, you know they had nothing but barbecue and watermelon, right? <laughs> in Alabama. Exactly, come on. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, 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 you know, but that was sort of the, that was the injustice and the indignity, you know, the undignity, you know, these things, the indignities paid to these wonderful legends, you know, of our ambassadors of goodwill in this music. And they still managed to carry themselves with this modicum of dignity and, and sophistication. Uh, uh, and, 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 and somehow found a way to let that, to, to let that just kind of wash off of them and keep on moving. Uh, um, and, and, you know, and I think, I think, uh, Sometimes nowadays, when I look at what what seems to be a repeat, just a, you know, a constant twenty year cycle of you know, a little we take a few steps forward and and, and twice as many steps backward in terms of social injustice and relation. And I see one of the things I like to stress to our people, people of color, people who feel disenfranchised, is that we you know, if if you if we allow the psychological impact of these things to linger, then uh, uh, all of our anger is for nothing. All of our, all, you know, you, you, have, you, you have to be resilient enough to, to shake off what's intended as a psychological impediment to, you, to your advancement. And if you do that, there's still enough room and freedom to be successful, but you, ha but you, but you have to remain focused and clear headed and and if you, and if you can somehow and you know and, and I mean if you, and if you can there's all and there's often there's all often way more than just psychological injustice. So if you but you know if you can just manage to steer clear of that, you can focus on the things that can help yourself and your community and you you know continue to move forward. And that was one of the things that I saw from these gentlemen as a young man, which was so inspiring because you know uh, uh, I can tell you like listen. Uh, for all the stories I heard about how how um, these men were mistreated, I you know I went I, my first tour with Jack McDuff was before the wall fell in Berlin. We were in, so I got to, I got to see Eastern Europe. Like I went to Bulgaria, Romania. I got to see I was in Yugoslavia in Belgrade when it was still Yugoslavia, and I was in East Germany. 
And I remember we, we were, we were um, on a train coming from uh, going to Berlin from Bulgaria and we, had, we were coming through East Germany. And I can actually say just as a, as a side note, it really did feel like the countryside was gray until we got to the border. <laughs> like, the, like it was black and white and then it was color. Like, that was really, really kind of how it felt. But when, when, the, when, the, uh, when the state police who patrolled the trains came to check our papers for, you know, for, for our, uh, uh, they came in with guns drawn into our train compartment and, 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 they, and they looked at me and they singled me out and made, I was maybe 20, 21 and they made me stand up when the guy had my passport and he was yelling at me in German, uh, knowing that I had no idea what he was talking about. But I, you know, I could, I just, you know, and he said, he said, and he wanted me, he did my passport and he took it like that. He said, now turn to the side. And he, you know, saying in German, he, he wanted me to do like this. And, you know, it was basically, you know, hop, hop on one foot and turn around and do a somersault, you know, and, and you know, with guns, you know what I mean? You know, and, and so uh, um, the feeling, uh, uh, I, you know, and, and the feeling of helplessness and, you know, and complete vulnerability um, was, uh, uh, was heavy. That was deep, you know, but um, my, I, I remember you know, thinking to myself, something I heard my father saying when we, we, we dealt with a similar situation like that years ago, he said, like, when you're gone, that man is gonna be stuck there on that cold, dirty train in that gray countryside checking somebody else's passports. And you're gonna be on stage at Carnegie Hall. So don't let him stop you from being you. Amen. Do go along, get along, get by. But you're on to greater and greener pastures and greater heights unless you allow him to stop you. That's right. And so that 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 uh, those things you know motivated me to keep moving forward and to and to be able as much as possible. I mean, you can still say I get a little agitated just thinking about it, but it's when you shake it off and you keep on moving. Uh, otherwise, it holds you in place, and that's really what all that stuff is designed to do: hold you in place. And you, you said several mouthfuls, you know, um, just, just listening to the different um, people that you've toured with, um, Jimmy Smith, that was a lot of wisdom. Um, you had wisdom on different levels throughout your journey. And, and to be able to uh, be surrounded with such musicians who were really scientists and doctors and very medicinal, going back to the whole medicine aspect of it, um, it was your own personal awakening throughout your journey. Um, and I think that's a blessing. You know, when I, when I hear these stories and I'm interviewing folks, I think about my father because he was born in 1927 and he was a musician. And you think about those different times. You mentioned about Alabama. And then you got Alabamas and Mississippis um, and all the different um, challenges they had to face as musicians. And here we are now um, dealing with a lot of social injustice issues that took place way back then and they're still happening now, just in a different um, perspective, but they're still, but you're right, you have to keep it moving, you know, not, not to say close your eyes to it, no, no, no. But, but you got to stay focused and, and stay on, on, on point. And, and which leads me to my next question, because, you know, you've had all this, you've been surrounded by all this wisdom and, and all this experience. And to be able to pass it on to your sons um, and as they experience their own personal journeys. So let's talk about your sons, Mark and Davis. You know, they are extremely talented musicians. Mark, the drums, Davis, piano. And I met them through my son, Jelani. Yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. Through my son, Jelani. Um, and I recall Jelani telling me that he met all of you in 2006 in New York at Jazz Standards. Yes. So talk to me about your sons, you know, seeing them as young men growing up to be such talented musicians. Well, first, I just want to say congratulations to you because Jelani is one of the finest young men I have ever met. He is he's a consummate student and musician and lover of the community. And he has, he has been the same bright-eyed, uh, matter-of-fact, truth-speaking, speak, truth uh, uh, um, uh, honorable, honorable person. From the moment I met him, to you know, to yeah. you know, and he called, he called me on my birthday to say, "Hey, Mister Whitfield, you know what I mean? He's just oh, such a beautiful, respectful young man, and, I'm, and I know I, I'm proud of him. So I can only imagine how proud you are. Yeah. And I was there to see him, uh, uh, at, you know, at the uh, when he, when he and Mark were graduating. 
Yes, right. And he played, and he played that great solo, and you know, and, and, and you know, and, 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 and the, uh, in the sports arena in Boston, you know. Uh, uh, and was, uh, was um, wasn't he like the speaker? Or I think. Yeah, yeah, he was the he was the he, he was the honor, he received his honorary doctorate that, and, yeah. and to see, uh, you know, to see to see them playing there in that way and shining like that, knowing where they had started, you know, the, the jazz standard. A good friend of mine, David O'Rourke, a great guitar player from Ireland, actually. Yes has been running, I believe he's, well, he, I wouldn't be doing it now, but before the, up until the pandemic, he's been running a, a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon jazz for kids program there for years. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we often underestimate the significance of these of band programs for young people. But I mean, the first 20 minutes of our interview was me talking about how important that was for me. Like, you know, that, that, playing playing in, in school and elementary junior high school and that made that gave me music that was my way of that that was that was my that that's how the world gifted music to me was through through my school programs and so uh, um we talk about how the how the inner, inner city schools and, and and so forth when, when funding is misappropriated because i won't say when funding is missing because it's always there but when it's not but when when it's not when it's not when it's been misappropriated and taken out of arts and stuff for schools uh, programs like that become infinitely more important, and so it was really nice that uh, um, that they were there. I know Andre Guess uh, uh, got uh, was uh, working for Winton at Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. He lived in my neighborhood here in Jersey City, and I met him because his his son Winton and, and Davis were in the same class in the third grade, yeah. and so I, I I feel like it was through them. But I can't. But I'm not sure how we how we first started going to the jazz standard. But we started. Marky was playing there, playing drums, and Jelani was playing trumpet in the band, and uh, uh, Rogers and and and, and uh, um, Melvin and those other kids that were playing. Uh, um, they had a, a wonderful circle of young people, okay. young kids. And, you know, they would get together and they, they were and they were responsible for for uh, learning a little song during the week and showing up in the morning and all the parents were sitting back and yep. talk to you know talk trash. And, make jokes and whatnot while the kids, you know, would practice this song and they had to perform and one kid each, one kid had to be the host. So every week, one, you know, one of the young folks had to get up and grab the microphone and introduce each other, introduce the other kids and, and you know, and, and it was just so funny. And I, you know, I, having experienced this as a young person, it was really wonderful for me to watch this with them. They could be fooling around and, and be rowdy and, and, and seem like uh, seemingly unfocused and unconcerned until the minute they hit the stage and it was time to perform <laughs> and nothing was funny. You know, all, everybody understood how serious it was because all of a sudden uh, 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 you were responsible for being able to do something that was gonna impress these people sitting in the audience. And for the most part, the audience was just people with little kids, with babies who kind of watched, you know, but it didn't matter. And it was really, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an amazing experience to watch the transformation on, on a young person's face when they realize that if you've worked hard and you were serious enough to prepare, you are prepared, you're ready, and, and you can have confidence and relax and really do your best. And if you haven't, if you haven't prepared, if you haven't practiced, if you're not serious, then when it comes time to play, uh, uh, you're gonna feel, when it's over, you're gonna feel somewhat unfulfilled. And it was really nice to see uh, uh, the transformation, especially for the kids who didn't get that right away and then realized, oh, they're having more fun at this than I am. I'm gonna go and practice. And uh, um, what was nice about Jelani and Mark and Davis, so they all sort of joined together. They, you know, we find each other. That's one of my favorite expressions. We <laughs> we find each other. You know, people who are like-minded, uh, uh, who have uh, uh, the same types of goals and aspirations, and and and, and the same sense sense of community. Uh, uh, um, community empowerment, so to speak. You know, we we, we all you know we 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 only going to go as far as we as as the weakest of us is going to go. That sort of thing, you know. And, exactly. and, and they came together, and I, and Jelani, uh, uh, there was for there was a time uh, um, when he spent as much time at my home as Mark and Davis did. You know, especially when they went to school, he would come. You know, he was he knew he was welcome here mm -hmm. all the time. You know, and and I was and I, I tell him, don't be a stranger. He was there. Come around and see me. You know, you always welcome. And 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 uh, I was, and it was just wonderful to see them play because um, I knew that 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 those moments were give were going to build a foundation for them. It wasn't about 
being exposed because they had a lot of great musicians come, a lot of a lot of stars come through, and guys, you know, well-known musicians come through and play with the kids and whatever, talk to them. And I never wanted, never wanted the boys to focus on interacting with these guys for what it might, for, uh, because of what it was going to, the dividends it might pay later on in your career. It, I, I just wanted them to soak up the information, soak up the experience, experience that feeling yeah. and, 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 and develop a relationship with that feeling for yourself because that's going to inspire you in, uh, you know, in the future to press on when times are tough. And, that's, and I think that's an important thing um, and I'm glad to always be able to share that message. You know, music is this, we think of music uh, most, most of the time as this joyous celebration of life. It is. You know, and and when we, get the, we get the chance to, to play and, and sing and, and, and create, and we, and we play tribute to people, and, you know, even, even in, in sad situations with people that we've lost, it's still somehow a celebration. Um, but mo but much of the much of our lives is spent fighting through adversity, overcoming obstacles, and dealing with problems. Mm -hmm. And those things, once again, can either be psychological and life altering impediments, or you can find ways uh, to be resilient and push through, and use those as stepping stones to reach greater heights. And and so uh, um, one of the things that I think is great about music is. We're constantly we, we're constantly presented with challenges. Something you can't play, something you can't conceive of yet, something that you know is out of your reach. And you realize that if you work hard, uh, uh, and this is good, you know this will come back up when I know you were, we want to talk about some of my contemporaries like Warren Harbour and McBride, people like that. This was a this was really at home for me because, uh, and this is not this is not me trying to be humble. I'm, this is me. For all of my success and and uh, and for my wonderful journey I've had, I am not the most naturally gifted musician you'll ever meet. Uh, I'm not. So I don't have an amazing ear. I didn't have. Uh, I, I don't. You know, a lot of it took me a long, a long time and a lot of work to reach. I always say that you know, uh, uh, create creativity is a series of doorways, mm. and 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 with with the unlocking of of each door. Uh, a new world of, of creative possibilities uh, uh, exist. And some people are born with the gifts that open all of the doors right away. Yes. And the only challenge is to, is to develop enough skill to take advantage of. And for me, I had two challenges. One, to develop the skill, and two, to, to, it, to it work and develop the gifts, that, what gifts that I did have uh, to hear and conceive of music to the point where I could then recognize that there were some doorways that hadn't opened yet. I had to become aware that those doors were there and then find them, open them and take advantage. And so um, for me, uh, uh, that's one, you know, I, I recognize that uh, um, every time I got, uh, uh, you know, uh, an encouraging word, helping hand, something, you know, uh, an attaboy from someone like George Pence or something like that, it was inspiring for me to continue to push forward because I felt like I was working at such a deficit. Uh, um, <laughs> and I think, and, you know, and, and this is this is a model for life. You know, we 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 have so many uh, peaks and valleys in our in our life journeys. You know, mm -hmm. I'm 54 now. I've, I've had several. You know, uh, um, but uh, I'm I'm encouraged because uh, either my wife or my children, or sometimes my mom when she when my parents when they were alive, or my brothers when they were alive, <laughs> somebody would have an encouraging word or something. Like, or, or even if it was just an ultimatum, like if, if, you, if you're going to give up, then we, then I, I'm not, I can't go down. I'm not going down with you. So you got to decide, are you going to stand or are you going to go down? And, you know, and, and these, these, these moments, um, every time I, every time I had a successful musical challenge, you know, these are things that build, build, I, 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 I like to make reference to sense of self and self-confidence. Yeah. Sense of self does, is not about um, thinking of myself comparatively. It's not about whether I'm better or, better than or stronger than or bigger than or greater than. It's about, am I strong enough to stand? Am I strong enough to, to, to move forward? Am I you know, to, to, to continue to stay resilient? And I, and I, look, I look back at, at my musical successes uh, and that helps to empower me when I come up with life challenges, when I come up against life challenges. And certainly we're all dealing with that now. I mean, you know, I worked really hard um, throughout 2000, the end of 2018 and 2019 so that I could take this band I put together on tour for 2020 and have all the wonderful things happen. 
did this new record with Chris McBride and Joey DeFrancesco and the big man. We're nominated for a Grammy this year. We're expected to, you know, do all these great things. And we're all stuck at home and probably stuck at home for another year. <laughs> I'll get a virtual, you know, I'll be, if we win, I'll be glad to have it, but it'll be a virtual Grammy award. You know, just, uh, <laughs> I, what, I, we won't plan to get, you know, get suited up and, and walk down the aisle. You know, it's just, but you have to be, we have to be resilient, uh, concentrate on, on, how amazing it is that at a time when so many people have lost so much, we are still able to be successful and move forward and plot and plan for the future and have anything, that's, you know, it, you know, the moral, the idea that we have anything to celebrate at all is a wonderful thing considering the struggles people are going through. And so these are, these are the lessons that I, that I think a lot of the young people going back to the jazz standard in a much smaller way, they got a, they got a taste of that. And, and, they, and, and it was nice to see Jelani and Mark and Davis, the other kids, experience success, like a song that was well performed and the crowd that enjoyed it, you know, and, and the pride that they felt in that made that, you could see, you could see that separating the ones, the kids who were going to be serious and the kids who didn't want, you know, who were just there because their parents wanted, wanted to have something to do on Sunday. And, 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 uh, and that, so that was a beautiful experience. It, it, it was a beautiful experience and they're, and they're all still so tight now. And, and that makes a big difference when you mentioned earlier, you know, like-minded people attract one another. You yeah. know, a lot of times people say opposites attract, but not so, not so true, not all the time. You know, we just, people just repeat rhetoric just for the heck of it and not even realize what they're saying half of the time, but um, they, they connected so well. Yeah, I remember when Jelani would, would go by your house and then I remember they would come to my house because I'm, you know, from New Orleans, you know, come on right. y'all, you know, but it, it was just, it's like they became our children as well, you know? Um, and, you know, looking looking ahead, Mark, you know, you, um, you know, you've created, I was gonna say something else and totally forgot what the heck I was gonna say because when you were talking about the whole like-minded aspect of, of, of things, but I'll just skip to this question because I, I, it'll come back to me. Um, but you have played and recorded with a diverse list of artists such as Sting, D'Angelo, Mary J. Blige. Talk about the importance of being versatile mm. as a musician. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny. That that's a two, that's a two-fold, two-sided question. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, no, sure, go ahead. Uh, um, the, the interesting thing about that is that, uh, actually, give me one second. One. Oh, oh I just all right i'm not a huge fan of winter but one of the things you can uh you can always look forward to if you're an allergy sufferer is allergy season's done. And so it got warm here and, and everything is blooming and all of I walk around itching and sneezing. And you're right there in New Jersey and you know, they got all kind of crazy stuff going on from New York to Jersey. So, so I, anyway, I, uh, yeah. I'll talk, get back to the, to, the, to the diversity question. And the reason I say it's, it's two-sided is this. Um, uh, one of the things that, you know, one of my favorite musicians from the generation, I think we are uh, uh, eight years apart. So I, I, I want to say the generation right ahead of mine uh, on the scene was Branford Marcellus, or is Branford Marcellus. And Branford is, is one of the most uh, naturally, uh, naturally gifted improvisers and, and, and voices on an instrument and, uh, uh, and, and just a, such a... a a sound innovator, a style innovator, and he had a particularly uh, strong impact on me uh, yeah. when I was coming up. Uh, you know, um, uh, and Branford, you know, as he started to enjoy so much success in the late '80s and the early '90s as, as as an artist, you know, coming out, or stepping out from from playing with Winton and doing his own thing. One of the things that's interesting is he appeared on so many recordings. You know, uh, um, <laughs> I used to got we used to tease him about. Uh, um, do, 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 do. What was the other girl? Uh, oh. uh, I like your style. Whoa, 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 you know, what was her name? Oh, that was Shanice. Shanice, right, right, right. Yeah. You know, he was playing the cycle solo in the music video. Uh, uh, 
But you know, uh, uh, I, I, I teased him about it, but what was so wonderful about it was that he um, he had a, he 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 had one voice, and he found a way. He had his own voice, and he found a way to uh, um, to make his voice to fit his voice appropriately and interestingly into different styles of music. So you could hear him playing with Winton. It, you know, play, uh, uh, playing some, you know, playing with his own band, playing with, you know, McCoy Tyner and Herbie and all. You can hear him playing with Sting. You can hear him playing with Shanice. You can hear him leading the Tonight Show band. You can hear him doing all these things. And it was always unmistakably him and uh, uh, unapologetically great. Yes. And so it spoke to his versatility, but it also spoke to his ability to, uh, um, to hear and internalize and 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 become a part of me and put his voice and his voice to sound, rather than oftentimes when people think of versatility, they think, okay, I'm, I'm going to learn how to do a bunch of different things, and and I'll uh, and I'll be a diff I'll I'll have a different personality, a musical personality based on whatever the whatever the thing is, you know, if it's this guy, I'll play like this, if it's this guy, I'll play like that, you know, and. And to a certain degree, you have to you have to follow, you have to let the music and your ear sort of be your guide, and to figure out what's appropriate for the situation. Yeah. But one of the things that helped me in I didn't even realize that I was on a journey uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, towards being uh, um, flexible. I just wanted I wanted to be able I wanted to play a great jazz guitar, mm -hmm. and so it started out. I remember getting a call. Um, my manager got a call saying there was this, this guy named D'Angelo who no one had heard of yet. Mm -hmm. he, had, he, 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 had, he hadn't done anything yet. Who was going, who was making the record and, and I was living in Louisiana at the time and, and I had my trio up. We were playing a concert at Queens College. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, we were doing a, a, a Northeast run. And, and so uh, on the way out of town, I said, hey, we just stopped by the studio on the west side of Manhattan. And you know they got you, got you some bread to play on this guy's record. Some guy named D'Angelo. Now I grew up on Long Island. Yeah. And I knew lots of D'Angelo's. They were all Italian, right? And so, <laughs> right. So I think, so I figured I was, you know, showing up to go play on somebody's jazz record. Some dude named it. You know, it, this was 1991, 1992. I didn't know you're D'Angelo. So I show up and I see and I see D in the room <laughs> and Bob Powell and this and I see Hargrove sitting in the corner. Cause they were already friends. And I'm like, man. I'm like, well, hey, wait, 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 what's that, there, man? And, what's up, bro? And 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 where's this D'Angelo cat? And he's like, man, that's me. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, well, cool. So, what you know, what what happens next, right? And so, they put the music on, and it was the it was the album Brand Sugar, you know, and and uh, and they start playing some tracks for me, and you know, now that's become. That you know that album and and few a few records from those from that two or three year period are you know they started an entire uh, new trend in R and B music you know the whole neo soul down tempo kind of thing right. but at that point no one had really heard anything like you know that that much uh, uh, to me. It reminds me of that scene in the Ray Charles movie where the band gets mad, gets mad because his new music is sounds like he's playing church music with yeah. secular lyrics, right? And so that's kind of how it was when I heard Brown Sugar. I was like, Man, this, this sounds like church music, you know. And he's, but and, you know, but like, like okay, you know. Uh, uh, and and I was, I gotta be honest, I you know, it's one of those situations where your desire to be, your desire to be well rounded, and your interest in in and trying to learn how to do different things would do you no good because there was no reference. I had no, I had no reference to draw on. What am I gonna play? What? Who should I listen to? Who did this? What can I copy? There was nothing. So I had to turn to that brand from Marcellus kind of that that attitude of well, I have a voice. That's right. Let me see how I can put my voice in this music and add something and get out the way. Like what can I do to be a part of this? And, uh, and and then I was thinking, and how can I make this sound for myself, man? This music is a, you know, like this cat is on to something. And uh, um, which I mean, the fact that Roy was sitting there on the couch with him says it all. Says all you need to hear, you know, because a few a few albums later, that's Roy. You know, a few years later, they did Voodoo the record together. Okay. Um, 
And while I didn't feel great about what I did, I was really inspired to, uh, to start my, at that day was the day I said, okay, it's time to start. It's, I, it's time for me to expand. Mm -hmm. Like I've worked really hard on this one thing, playing this really pure straight ahead jazz music. And I love it. And it's, and it, and it, it's, it, it, it's, a, and it's given me a platform to develop a sound and a voice and a style. Uh, uh, based on the music that I've been listening to from the, that, you know, that happened over the last 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Mm -hmm. Now, what can I do so that going forward, my music sounds less like a history lesson and more like uh, um, a presentation of what I'm hearing in my imagination's ear? What can I do to share what I'm imagining what I think, what I'd like to do next, based on what I've, where I've come from, what I've learned, what I've heard, what I love. What can I give people uh, uh, so that when they think of the music I play, sure, it'll be jazz, it'll be whatever you want to call it, but it, it, but they will, but they'll they'll know it came from it came from my heart and from my soul. And what, how will I, you know? And and so I was inspired to start listening, opening my ears. To, to other things, other people, other, 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 and start soaking up these other influences and, and recognizing the, the genius in all, these other, in all these other styles of music and other, and other you know, and other, other kinds of musicians and other instruments and, and sounds. Um, but I allowed my love of jazz and the virtuosic purity that's required to play and understand and love and, and live in the music to be my guide. Through, uh, uh, sifting through and sorting through influences and ideas going forward. You know, you, um, that sounds so poetic. You know, I feel like you need to say that again, but I get it. You know, um, you, you were in a certain comfort zone, but you were able to come out of that comfort zone and tailor it to what you have already learned and what you're used to doing um, and then apply it. You know, and I think that's a very important message, Mark, because even even to musicians today who um, who may you know have grown up learning one style, but just learning the history of music itself is important. Oh, sure. You know, the journey of music, whether it's jazz, pop, R and B, rock, whatever that may be, they all come together and collaborate some kind of way. Oh yeah. So I think that's <clears throat> that's a very important message. You know, you mentioned um, time in Louisiana, um, and I understand you spent some time in my hometown, New Orleans, um, and in Baton Rouge in the 90s. Um, talk, what was that scene like back in the 90s? So um, uh, the boy's mother, uh, Jody Wag's wife, she was from Baton Rouge. And so we lived, uh, we, went, we met at Berkeley, and we, <laughs> we, um, we lived in Brooklyn for a couple, of, for three years, and then when Lil Mark was born, we moved, we moved uh, bought a house in Baton Rouge. And so, uh, my brother had a brownstone in Brooklyn, and so I maintained the place there, and I would kind of go back and forth. Uh, and I knew some guys uh, who had just started going to UNO, Peter Martin, uh, Brian Blade, Chris Thomas, Jeremy Davenport, uh, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, and so I, and I knew Peter Martin because he was playing with, he was playing with Marlon Jordan. And my and my brother-in-law at the time, Troy Davis, was, was playing drums with them, and he brought and Martin. And so Peter started playing in the band, you know. And I and I and of course I was already playing with Donald Harrison, Terrence Blanchard, and those guys. But they were all part, you know, firm, firmly entrenched in, in the New York scene. But I knew they were from New Orleans, and it was remarkable to me that that you know Terrence and Donald and Branford and Winton, four of the most important musicians in my mind at that yeah. time, were all from this one area in New Orleans. I was like, they were, I don't know what they're drinking down there, but I need to get some. <laughs> Whatever's in the water, please, you know, turn that on at my house, right? So, oh, oh man. Uh, so going to bed, you know, being, we lived sort of, uh, sort of halfway between mm -hmm. and New Orleans. And so I, I spent a lot of time at Snug Harbor. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 that's where I got to know Ellis Marcellus. You know, and Ellis was really special to me. We were really close, uh, and Ellis was uh, once again. It, you know, uh, uh, he and Alvin Batiste were also part of that of that generation of musicians. It was just really simple. 
Exactly. You got this. You need to get this. Work it out. Get it done. Keep it moving. It's, it, you know, it's, 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 don't discuss it. We're not going to debate it. It just it, it, if you got this, you need to have this. You know, and and uh, and with Ellis could he would just you know and bat, two of them. Uh, I spent a lot of time playing with both of them in different situations. Uh, with one. You know, it's funny. You know, I, I think of this a lot when I when I hear people talk. But if someone asks you a question, or you're presented with a problem. You always know when someone really has a grasp of the answer, where they can, in ten words or less, give you the solution. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, if it takes all day to explain, yeah. <laughs> chances are it ain't gonna work out. But man, well, you know, uh, uh, Ellis could take it. You know, and and of course, I had met briefly in New York. I had met Young Nicholas Payton. He was about 16, we were five, years, five or six years apart, maybe five years apart. And so I immediately reconnected with him when I got down there. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I could, you know, I, I would have never known, you can never say for sure you know what's coming, but you would go by, Nicholas, Nicholas had an apartment uh, in the night ward, you get a house, you go by his house, and it was just full of instruments. You know, he <laughs> it was a bass and a drum set, and piano and a rose and a whole bunch of, and he would spend all day playing all of them. Uh, and, he was, and he was pretty good on all of them, even back, even as, you know, a teenager, 1920, even 21, whatever it was. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what's coming, but whatever it is, this dude is, <laughs> this dude is bad. Like, you know, we're about to hear something from this guy. Uh, and so we spent, I spent a lot of time when I wasn't on the road. Uh, and back then we tried, you know, uh, there were so many jazz clubs and so, and so much, there was so much music scene available. I spent a lot of time on the road, which is great because I had to feed my young family and, and I still had a lot of development uh, uh, and a lot of growth to do. But um, when I was home, I would spend a lot of time in New Orleans playing at Slug, uh, playing at the Funky Butt. We used to play Friday and Saturday nights. Wet me, Wes Anderson, Donald Edwards, uh, um, and, you know, and Nick with different guys. And um, that's, interestingly enough, where I think the uh, most significant uh, of, of the two stages of my development happened was there. Was your first, the first part was at Berkeley, and, you know, and, 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 my, and my first few years living in Brooklyn and being around. But then getting to New Orleans, it was a much smaller scene of cats. Uh, but because of that, the microscope was much, you know, the, the view, pe people's view of you was much, was much clearer. Because yeah. you, you, there, were, there wasn't a lot of distractions. They could always see and hear you. And so, um, I never wanted to, you know, I, I didn't want to show up next Friday playing the way I played this Friday. Exactly. You know, and so, uh, and I, cause I knew everybody would know it. So I would, and, and being around, it was a, sort of a pressure cooker in a way. Because all these great guys, we all wanted to impress one another by having more to offer. It wasn't, it, that was the interesting thing. It wasn't about being able to outdo each other. Uh, in a lot of ways, none of us, we didn't really do the same thing, but it was really all about having more to offer. And, and uh, um, every time somebody came up, you know, would discover something new, a new concept, a new thing, we'd kind of share it with the group. That was kind of the thing, especially around Nicholas, because Nicholas was such, uh, even then, he was a beacon of ideas. He was just a beacon for, you know, for creativity and, 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 and inclusion. And um, Nick, Nicholas was, uh, I, was I call him a, a, a polite challenger. <laughs> because he would, he would show up, you know, uh, he would show up to snug sometimes. Like Peter Martin uh, would have the piano trio gig, you know, and would have me there. Uh, in fact, we did we did in fact for, we we did duets a lot uh, for we did a, a bunch of duets, just guitar and piano, and then we'd have bass and drums. And Nick would show up with his, with his trumpet, but he, so but before he would play his trumpet, he'd look at the stage and he'd point to the piano, the bass, and the drums, and say, "Okay, which one of you guys gonna let me sit? Like, who wants to get up?" Because <laughs> he's like, I don't care which one I sit in on, but what, you know, and, and whoever felt like you know, whoever felt like being embarrassed by the trumpet player who was going to sit in on your instrument was the one you know who would get up. It was Jeff Clapp on bass, or, or uh, 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 Shannon Powell, oftentimes on drums, you know, or Peter, he'd get up and just let Nick embarrass him. All, you know, he just he couldn't play guitar. That was the only way he said. I was always <laughs> But I was like, whoa, you know. But I, but back then, I, I refer to him as the as the as the as the, as the people's polite heavyweight champion because he would show up. It's kind of like, well, which one of y'all get? You know, <laughs> like he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't challenge it directly. He'd say, okay, somebody's getting it, you know. 
and uh, uh, we got to be really close. And one of the, you know, just one of the one of the really uh, greatest moments as a parent was uh, uh, I think I've had, I've had a lot thanks to my boys, but well, uh, uh, last year, last fall. Nicholas played a week with his quartet at the Blue Note in New York, and he had Lil Mark with him on drums. And I'm just looking at Lil Mark standing next to a dude that I used to play with, you know, 20 years ago in that same setting, and it was just really refreshing, and, 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 and I was so proud. Yeah, Nick Nicholas Payton, I interviewed him um, a couple, about a month ago. Um, uh, very talented cat. Yeah. He he spoke very fondly, which is my next question. He spoke very fondly of Roy Hargrove. Um, so I know both of you all had um, such a great relationship with him. Yeah. Talk about your time, you know, knowing Roy. Well, I met Roy when he was still at Berkeley. Uh, I was already in, uh, in living in New York. I think he got, to, he got to Berkeley. I believe he started in the fall of 87 that I had graduated in the spring of 87. So somewhere around there. Uh, but I met him, we were, we were all sitting in with Art Blakey. And, uh, and then I, you know, he was coming down to New York quite a bit. It didn't take long. I mean, Roy was such, uh, he was such a lightning bolt. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the legend that Roy Hargrove was spreading. Uh, uh, and I remember the first time I saw him, the first time I actually met him, we were outside of Bradley's in the, East, in the, in the West Village. And he was wearing a suit that didn't fit. Apparently he had borrowed a, he had a gig, didn't have, and he borrowed a suit from Delphio Marcellus, who was a lot taller. And I was like, man, who is this kid in this suit that didn't fit? You know, and it's, and it's interesting because Roy became such a such a big clothes horse. You know, he had like he just he was just a fashion. Uh, you know, he he, he was a he, he was a, a a beacon of of high fashion. But I remember seeing him in that suit that didn't fit. I was like, man, this kid is crazy. Uh, uh, but then I heard him play, and I was like, "Man, you know," uh, uh, and he and I joined this band. Wow. So I played in, in Roy's band. I played as as the sixth member of the Royal Hargrove excuse me, quintet. Uh, so it was a sextet off and on for uh, from 1980, 89, uh, and 1990. And through Roy, I got to play playing tour with Carmen McRae and other people. Uh, uh, but Roy, uh, first of all, I, I don't, I don't know that I, that I really have the words to describe how how he impacted, how how taken aback I was by his ability to hear, uh, conceive of, formulate, and and and, and present music. It, he was just a conduit for creativity. It just mm. oozed out of him. It, any setting, and it was it was never about what he had learned. Sure, he stuck. You know, well, I spent the time that I, I spent a lot of time with him traveling and things. Most of the time, when we were on the road. He was reading poetry and, and you know and, and, and studying uh, literature. Uh, he was uh, Roy was Roy had a lot of uh, um, que uh, questions about humanity. Mm -hmm. I think he was looking for for spiritual uh, awakening in that in, in that realm. Music was just the way he expressed himself, and he had no problem with that. Some people just had, like I, I, I said, I said I would, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that we we get to this when Roy's name came up. Right. There are some people who just there's no block, there's no uh, there's no hurdle, there's no between them and complete ultimate creative expression, and he's that way. You know, I've been around a few people. Uh, that I feel all that way, and, I, and I'm gonna admit it's, it's a list, it's an impressive list, and I stand on it. Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, Roy. That's Hollified, yeah, it really I, is. You know, and I dare somebody to challenge me on that. There's, there may be more lists, maybe more days on the list, but you can't take Roy's name off. I totally and, agree with you. And 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 I and Roy, he could step off the stage with the quintet. And jump on the stage with Cool the Gang, and jump and do the steps, and play, and then play the horn parts, and then you know, and then uh, uh, run across to another stage at the jazz fest and jump on with D'Angelo and play those parts, take the solo, and then grab a mic and sing something, and then come in, and then and have Greg Hutchinson jump on the turntables, and Roy can rap a little bit for you, and then go right back over and grab his trumpet, sit in with Carmen McRae or Ray Brown, 
you know, in a, in a, all in a two hour radius. Oh, and be amazing. You know, we would do we do stuff like that at these festivals, your balls, and Roy would, he'd be amazing at all of it. Man, it would take most folks a month to get through all that. And and so and and he would do it without Pat and I. Uh, 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 hmm. You know, I, I remember, you know, we'd be sitting, we'd be on, you know, we were kids, and so we have. It was rough travel schedules because I imagine you could handle it. You know, you trap on train all night, flying all day, the whole thing. We we come dragging in, you know, limping into the sound check and run. pick his horn up, boy. Let's see what he can open his eye, pick his horn up, bam. And and you it, you were hard pressed to keep up. And he was like that till the day he got, you know, uh uh I um and once again, one of my proudest moments, you know, uh happened with him and Davis. Uh Mm. Roy started, you know, Roy was, he believed in the importance of, of uh, being connected to young musicians, but for, for a very pure and uh, unapologetic reason, which I was so, I was so grateful to see him do. Roy's thing was a lot of us old guys, because now we're the old guys, right? We sit around and talk about how the young cats they don't, they don't, you know, they don't play like we used to. They don't, they don't love music like, like we used to. We don't, you know, we sit at home talking shit about it. Yeah. Roy was like, no, no, no. I'm going to go out every night when I'm out on the road and combine and interface with these kids. I'm going to play and show them hmm. who I am. Show them how I love music, what I love about music. And sometimes teach them or talk to them about it. But rather than sitting at home talking about what they're not doing, I'm going to give them the opportunity to see what they could be doing, not even what they should be doing, but what they could be doing. And those that and those that want to learn and want to follow, they'll come along. And Roy was a fixture at every session in every club in New York for years when he was off the road. And so uh, when David started playing a lot at, at Smalls, Roy, Roy would make it a point to be there. If David was playing, Roy, Roy would be the listener, checking him out, talking to him, hanging out with him. You know, having a drink with them, they play some music, talk, you know, talk some trash, whatever. And and uh, uh, Roy had expressed an interest in hiring Davis to play in his band, but he never got around. He never got the chance to do that. But he wrote a song mm. that he wanted Davis to play. And he had Davis. Roy was playing a week with his band at the Blue Note. He had Davis come to the club and play that song with his band. He brought him up on stage and said he wrote a song. Uh, he wanted Davis to be you know, kind of for Davis to play it. And so here I am sitting there. Watching Davis play play with the man who hired me to be in his band in 1988. I watched my son up there killing, playing the song, yeah. right and feeling yeah. like it had come full circle. It did. That's right. You know, and, and and once again, like I said earlier, I'm just so proud to have been to be part of of the, the living, breathing legacy that is you know music. And Roy, uh, uh, I can't I can't say enough about his angelic presence. Yes, we're in the world of music and art and creativity, and as a human being, Roy, um, for all of his eccentricities and issues, I can honestly say I don't ever remember him doing anything wrong to anyone. Now I'm not saying he was. I'm sure he did plenty, but the thing is, when you you know, even some of my closest friends, I know plenty. I can. Right, I can come up right, 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 right away. I come up with all kinds of stuff. We did good, and bad. But with Roy, he was always just playing music, and he was purely, he was purely about moving straight forward. Hmm. And 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 hmm. uh, um, and he and he was just someone who was not worried about his ability to make it happen. And that's what I talk about when I say sense of self and self confidence. Hmm. You, you know, for, you just, you couldn't convince Roy that he, that it wasn't possible for him to do it. He wouldn't even consider that. He was a, he was another level of amazement. Yeah. And his versatility was on a whole nother level. Absolutely. Um, and that says a whole lot about him. It, it, and it's, it's great to hear, you know, you sharing your thoughts on Roy and, and, and listening to Nick you know, and there's so many other great stories, but, you know, he, like I said, he was a, a, another level of amazement. And I think that's, you know, even just his impact on the, the younger generation um, made a difference. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something a little different. I want to, 
Is there a question you would like to ask yourself that no one else has? Sure. And you know, it's funny. I thought about this and I've often wondered, it seems like such a, it seems like such an obvious question. Nobody ever asked me, why do you play? What's the question? The question is, why do you play? Yeah, man, why do you play? <laughs> why, you know, why do you play? I mean, well, you know, why do you spend hours and hours and hours? Like George Messings once said, someone asked George when I was way young, you know, we were doing something together. Someone asked her, I said, George, what is it, you know, what is it about this young man you like? What is it about, you know, what is, what's one thing you like about him? And George said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, if Mark was driving down the highway, he got a flat tire, he'd pull over, start practicing, and wait for somebody else to come change his tire. <laughs> he said, he just, you just, in any, every spare moment, he's got that guitar in his hand. Hmm. And I and so and 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 that's just something that every anyone who knows me, even just casually, kind of knows that's me, you know. But no one has ever asked me why do I play. Hmm. Uh, and, and it's simple. I'm at I'm at my I'm at my absolute best in terms of the way that that I, the person that I. The person that I want everyone to see. When I think of when I think of myself, the person I want to see, and the person that I want everyone to see, that person is at his best hmm. with the guitar in his hand. Uh, and it's not about it's not about uh, um, and it's not because it's not because I think it's something to hide behind or, or crutch. It's the the feeling that I get and the and the and the emotions that come up and the, and the, and the the uh, sensibilities that I that I become aware of, like I see my best. I, my vision is the clearest when I'm playing the guitar. And my eyes are closed, yes. and you got to ask me how is that? But I can see everything in the world. Mm. Uh, I can see everything that happens around me. My, I feel like I'm 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 the most connected to the human beings around me, to my environment. When I'm when I, when I'm in that pure creative zone, and so I long I could live in that zone 24 hours a day. You know, it's it, that that so that's why I play. Is once I got a taste of that, I couldn't let it go. You know, I wake up every day thinking, man, if I could just, you know, sometimes I'm in even my living room and I'm practicing, and I'm in that zone, and I catch myself and I'm like, I hope nobody's talking, because <laughs> I'm playing like I'm in front of a crowd and there ain't no crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little wife probably like there is again. <laughs> Go on and gone off again, <laughs> you know. And I remember doing a gig with some friends of mine. In fact, I tell you, you might know him, John. So know him, a trumpet player from New Orleans, Antoine Dry. We were doing a gig here. We were playing, uh, uh, you know, all these outdoor gigs. You got to play and all this stuff. We were doing a thing. It was sort of a casual thing. And I had just, I was just so hungry to play. You know, I hadn't played in a while because of the pandemic. And then I was gone. I was in it. And he looked when I got away. You know, when I, when I got finished playing, I was like, I'm "Like, oh, did I?" And he was like, "Yeah, just you know, <laughs> come on back in." <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, you was gone." You know? He's like, yeah, "You know, just come, come on back in a little bit, bro." You know, and, and, and but but see, I'm okay with that. Yes. If you gonna catch me with you, you gonna catch me, catch me with you know, with my guard down. That's what I want you to catch me doing. You know, and and and, and so. There's no other reason. It's, it's, it, that's what it is. I play because once once I once I found you know that nirvana that whatever that is that 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 pure that place of pure creative expression and communication. I, I, that's I've never tasted or touched anything great. So that's why I do it. And and I'm sure every time you play, each moment is different. There's a transcending moment for each moment. Um, of that creativity. Sure, so sure. that says a whole lot, you know, and I'm glad you asked yourself that question. So I said to myself, self? <laughs> you're right, a lot of times you, you're an artist, you know, and a lot of folks someday ask you all these other questions, but like, what is that one question? Yeah. So, so Mark, what's on the horizon for you? Um, that's, a, you know, that's tricky. Um, because, you know, if you had asked me that in February, Mm -hmm. uh, the horizon, I just had all sorts of plans. Um, first thing, uh, uh, I, I, I've been saying this a lot lately, was survival was always the name of the game. 
Yes. Uh, but now it's it's how you it's how you define survival that matters. And for me, survival is not treading water, right? Because if you're not moving forward, you're moving back because the world moves forward. Time is moving forward without you. Uh, and so that that harsh realization first mm -hmm. you know, uh, after coming out of my two month three month long depression like everybody else, I got really involved in teaching. And so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, um, a mentor at the GMI, the Guitar Mastery Intensive Program out of San Francisco. And I have 10 students, uh, and I, I get 10 new students every three, every three months, and I keep a good rotation of that going. I also have a streaming channel on the True Fire Guitar Network uh, that's going live uh, in December. Uh, Davis and I have been recording uh, a duo, a duet project, just guitar and piano. Here, we turned our living room into a recording studio. We've been doing that. Um, I uh, uh, intend to get to get get to some touring with Chris McBride and Joy DiFrancesco in, in a quartet setting and in the big band setting when the world when the world allows. I am eager to do a second family band record with Mark and Davis and Yasushi. Oh, that's and some great. Other special guests, um, and uh, I have. Um, some projects I'd like to get involved in. I have one I've been working on. Uh, 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 it's a TV. It's it's a it's a twist on a TV show idea, on a, on, a, on a video show idea, uh, where I'm the student, not the teacher, and I got people coming on to teach me things. And so uh, uh, it's a project that's been developed in that. Um, and uh, um, I don't, so I don't really have any big collaboration to talk about. Like, you know, uh, that would have been my focus a year ago. Like what, you know, what artists co collaborations am I gonna come up with? Who am I gonna work with coming up? What are we gonna do together? And now uh, one of the things that this whole experience has taught me is to focus more on what I can create and share with people uh, uh, um, from a stationary point as opposed to um, who can I combine with to create something bigger than the two of us and go out and take advantage of what that is. Uh, um, I, think those, I think those ideas and opportunities will come organically from, uh, out, they'll, they'll come from this new sense of, of uh, self-awareness. And so, you know, redefining myself, my uh, uh, my job, you know, my my ability to earn a, earn a living and help you know help me. so my wife and I can work together to take care of our family. You know, uh, uh, fortunately, she's never had to stop working during all of this. You know, and so um, uh, one of the things that really you're trying to realize what I can do a new level of self awareness is recognizing that rather than constantly marching forward, sometimes it's good to stop and take inventory and just look at her and say, "Man, I've got." 30 some odd years behind me of all this experience and all these things. And I discount it so, so casually, just in the fact that I'm constantly looking for the next thing to do before I even take advantage of uh, or, or maximize the potential of the things that I've done, sharing that information with people, growing. As I teach, I learn. And so I'm really trying to focus a lot on um, sort of catching up. You know, to look back at, at, at my, you know, my career from 1988 to, to the present, oh man, okay, great. Let me just go back and go through all of that and, 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 and uh, um, pick, up, pick up on some of those, on some of those ideas that I, did, that I didn't follow through on and uh, share and, and, and uh, um, talk more about the things that went into those projects, the people that I met, the things that, uh, the ideas that came out of it. And, and focus on that going forward so that uh, I get the most out of what I have to offer and what I've, and, and the, experience that I, the experiences that I've learned and the knowledge I've gained along the way. Yes. Man, you know, I, um, I'm listening to you talk about what's on the horizon and I was literally just taking some notes and um, you just, you know, certain words pop in my mind, creativity and thinking about what you've poured into your journey, what other people have poured into you, what you've poured into your, your sons and others. Um, and I keep hearing people say, and I know you've seen it on social media, 
folks keep saying, throw 2020 out the window. Well, guess what? It, it, I don't, I, I, I say something differently. I'm grateful. You know, um, this pandemic has taught us a lot. I, I mean, 2020 was gonna come no matter what, just like 2021, 2022 and so forth and so on. And, you know, and my prayers continue to be with those who have suffered um, in, in many different ways. But I've always been taught um, that the challenges are all a part of our growth and with much difficulty comes relief. So, you know, hearing your, your you know, I don't like calling these interviews because they're really conversations. Um, you've brought me back to many different aspects of my life. Um, you've taken me on a journey, not just your journey, but I'm just looking at the different aspects. So I wanna thank you, Mark, for your contributions to creativity, to hard work, to the music scene, to your son, to my son, to your community, and so much more, brother. You, you, you are a true inspiration, so thank you so much. Thank you, it's my pleasure, and, and, and so are you. And I, and, and, and I love being able to point to, to the people who, are, who, who continue to make it clear and obvious that um, the sky's the limit, Yes. Uh, we are we are we are our own best engines for change and 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 success going forward and and the most important and the most important aspect of that is you never even stop to think whether or not you can that's right you just keep marching for what you just do that's right that's right so man listen you said oh my God. you look same to you you know um you know much success many blessings for a, a, a wonderful path for you, your wife, and your family, your, your sons. Keep doing it, man. And I'm going to be looking out for that Grammy. So we'll get all dressed up in here. And <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we'll have a virtual toast. Amen. Right. <laughs> we'll do more FaceTime, man. Right, 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 right. Beautiful, beautiful. Listen, I'm glad you. we got to share this time together. It's my pleasure. Thank oh, you. Man, for that's, that's, it's getting too cold out here. So, you know. You get rid of the allergies because I know I've been doing the same thing. Like, oh, <laughs> crazy. Oh. All this right. has been Anything and Everything Artist Series, everyone. We've had the amazing Mark Whitfield Sr. Stick around for a special treat from Mark. Until next time, peace and blessings.